Çık çık çık. Are we live? Sunil? Not it. Yes ma'am, we are live ma'am. All, all platforms. Welcome uh, everyone to this uh, webinar and this is a webinar with a difference today. Uh, seven days after the second Sunday of May, we generally observe seven days as a week and that week is known as Know the Glow Week, which is the World Retinoblastoma Week. So beginning from 10th May to 17th, 17th May, we've had uh, World Retinoblastoma Week to make uh, people aware about the eye cancers which are uh, there in the children's eyes. Uh, today we have with us a speaker who uh, uh, needs completely no introduction in the field of retinoblastoma. He's the torchbearer of retinoblastoma as far as India is concerned. Uh, we have today with us uh, Dr. Santosh Hunavar, he was also a very good friend uh, uh, from RP Center and also the editor of the Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, uh, the AIOS. He's the director of the National Retinoblastoma Foundation and Department of Ocular Oncology and Ophthalmic and Facial Plastic Surgery, Center for Sight, Super Speciality Eye Hospitals. Uh, he did his basic medical education at Bangalore Medical College, was the best graduate of the Bangalore University in 1988. At RP Center, he received the best resident award from where he did his uh, post-graduation as well as his senior residency. He further trained in ocular oncology at Wills Eye Institute and thereafter established the comprehensive ocular oncology service at LV Pisad Eye Institute, Hyderabad, the first such in the country. And currently, he heads the National Retinoblastoma Foundation and the Department of Ophthalmic and Facial Plastic Surgery, Opet and Ocular Oncology at the prestigious Center for Sight, Hyderabad. He's done a lot of work in retinoblastoma, ocular surface, and orbit, and he has uh, more than 150 publications in the international peer-reviewed journals to his credit. He's recipient of the major awards and honors. You name any international or national award and he has it. It includes the Pfizer National Award, the Rangachari uh, Gold Medal by the AIOS, the Argo Santon International Fellowship, Ziegler International Fellowship, Orbis International, Young Scientist Award, the uh, Indian Society of Oncology, Best of the Show Award by the American Academy of ophthalmology for surgical videos uh, several times, uh, senior achievement award by the American Academy of Ophthalmology, which he uh, received this year, though he doesn't look that senior. And of course, uh, to top it all, the prestigious Shanti Soro Bhatnagar Award from the Government of India in 2009. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Santosh Honavar and uh, to uh, ask him to give his, give his talk on retinoblastoma. Before that, I would like uh, Professor Maipal Sachdev, who is the president of All India Ophthalmological Society, to say a few words. Well, uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on uh, retinoblastoma. As uh, uh, Professor Namrata has already said uh, things uh, about Dr. Santosh, but what I, uh, he's been associated with us for the last uh, seven years now. And as much as I know him earlier as a resident and now uh, as, as uh, the leading light of, I would say, this entire region for the world for uh, oncology as also for ophthalmoplasty. I know that uh, he trains patients from all across India as also from overseas. But I think the singular biggest honor that he has got the Lifetime Achievement Award the American Academy of Ophthalmology. I don't think any other Indian ophthalmologist has been put at the Lifetime Achievement Award for uh, Ophthalmology by the American Academy of Ophthalmology. He's really somebody who also knows how to uh, give so much of knowledge and education to the postgraduates and to the fellows uh, that I know that uh, the most sought after fellowship uh, uh, in Center for Sight today is for Ocular Oncology at Hyderabad. And uh, also, he knows what the ophthalmologists want as their teaching training, whether it is going to get exams uh, done, the postgraduate, uh, etc. So, overall, I think he's a fantastic teacher, a great human being, and somebody who actually uh, I found uh, 
so namrata is also sitting here she is also one of those uh, where the they are work alcoholics and uh, the turnaround time for both of them or uh, also for santosh is uh, near zero so i think uh, it will be great because he has so much of knowledge bank about retinoblastoma its treatment he is up to date with all that is there it will be a great uh, learning and listening for all of us in aios and specifically those who deal with field of ophthalmology so i think uh, without much ado uh, we would uh, wish to start with this uh, uh, presentation hope would be really really uh, very excellent and uh, uh, we'll get a lot of knowledge uh, from this uh, and uh, world retinoblastoma etc that uh, we, uh, we do uh, the entire country does that uh, rp center has done initiatives uh, we also do initiatives uh, hold painting competitions etc those time because of the covid uh, the activity level was slightly low but i think uh, this is something which is very very important because it's the commoner commonest ocular tumor uh, in uh, the childhood so over to uh, uh, dr satosh for uh, his talk on retinoma good evening am i audible yes yes santosh okay great Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, speak on the platform of uh, AIOS webinar because it is one of the prestigious uh, webinar platforms that we have and is uh, very well received and attended thanks to the efforts of AIOS office bearers. It's a pleasure to speak on something that is very close to my heart that's retinoblastoma especially during uh, the retinoblastoma awareness week. Why should we know about retinoblastoma? because it is the most common intraocular malignancy in children it is also a deadly tumor with a potential for up to 50% mortality and presents mostly to an ophthalmologist first as opposed to any other malignancy which may go to any other specialist here the child comes to an ophthalmologist with predominantly ophthalmic symptoms and it is completely curable if it is detected early so early detection and its primary presentation to the ophthalmologist give, puts us in a very unique position to diagnose this and get these children treated world retinoblastoma awareness week is observed from the second sunday of may for a week that is 10th to 16th of this month in this year the main goal of this week is to create awareness about the early diagnosis of retinoblastoma this is a evolution in the management of retinoblastoma as you see here mortality earlier used to be 85 to 98% that higher mortality then enucleation came in as the only possible modality for management of retinoblastoma and followed by external beam radiation so enucleation came in and was the only possible management until about 1950s then very slowly crept in external beam radiation with excellent success compared to only enucleation but not compared to what kind of success that we have now then in the late 1990s came in intravenous chemotherapy it ruled up to about 2010 and currently it's the era of intra arterial chemotherapy and intra vitreal chemotherapy so as compared to 1900s in 2020 we have 98% survival as opposed to 98% mortality so there's a dramatic turn around in the management and prognosis of retinoblastoma so it's been a obvious a success story in fact no other malignant disorder systemically has as good a survival as retinoblastoma currently it's the most successful story in terms of survival essentially that's happened because of early diagnosis and improved methods of treatment in developed countries that is the situation excellent care excellent prognosis because of early diagnosis whereas in developing countries mortality is more than 50% still it's mainly because of delayed detection and the presence of high risk cases these are the problems with developing countries this is the world retinoblastoma map as you see here india is dark blue and it has the highest incidence of retinoblastoma essentially because we have a high live birth rate 
followed by china so this part of the world india and china and some parts of africa and south america have the highest incidence of retinoblastoma these are the data that we have 5000 to 6000 new cases in the world estimated incidence of 1500 to 2000 new cases every year in india new retinoblastoma reference to major centers is about 600 only which means that out of about 1500 new cases that happen in india only about 600 go to referral centers which means that about 70% of these children either don't get treated at all because we have no data on them in india or go to primary or secondary levels of healthcare where enucleation is possibly the only treatment available and protocol based management is not performed and we also know that the mortality is 30 to 50% if protocol based management is not performed so what in essence it means that 70% of children in india are not receiving protocol based management as in 2017 and in the last 3 years i don't think the situation has changed dramatically let's go to clinical manifestations the most common sign or symptom is leukocoria it's seen in about 42% of children this is the number that we had 2800 eyes of which leukocoria was present in 42% leukocoria is the most common symptom as well as the sign of retinoblastoma followed by squint it could be either esotropia as you see in this child or exotropia depending on the age of onset of retinoblastoma and the location in the macula 23% is the incidence of squint as the primary symptom or sign in others reduced vision could be the symptom especially in older children or children with macular tumor poor attention to visual stimuli may be the symptom in elder children who may be able to verbalize they may complain of reduced vision in a particular eye very minority of patients have redness as a symptom redness of the eye is not a very common symptom followed by proptosis in about 6 to 8% of children this is because of orbital extension of retinoblastoma and that's the entire clinical spectrum this is how the tumor begins a small tumor in the posterior pole develops into a visible leukocoria when the tumor fills about 2/3 of the eye or even half the eye if it's a posteriorly located tumor strabismus extraocular extension orbital inflammation and a fungating lesion which is very very rare currently now what are the maskrats of retinoblastoma there are several maskrats of retinoblastoma and we should be aware of it because generally you know retinoblastoma doesn't present like this so these are diagnosed as simulating conditions and the treatment is delayed one of which is orbital cellulitis so if a child has orbital cellulitis for no reason and it is not resolving with conventional antibiotics you are supposed to do imaging imaging either a simple ultrasound b I think there is a small <coughs> audio burn. Let the next one. I think Sujoy will need to log in again. Admin, पीछे से ही problem है. This is Santosh. Doctor Santosh's uh, problem, sir. The video is frozen. Frozen. Let me just check out once.
Was there a disconnection? No, you're back now. Okay, fine. Yeah. But we can't see your slides. Okay, fine. I'll share the screen again. Uh, have you joined in from a new connection? It seems, or it's the same. I joined again, sir. Then is Santosh. We feel stuck. Ho gaya, I think. Santosh, are you there? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, your previous one is stuck. Can you move, or uh, you'll mm -hmm. have? Uh, yeah. Okay. Now you share again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
right? So this is a diffuse variant of retinoblastoma, often manifests with anterior chamber seeding, such as uveitis, hypopion, and also vitreous hemorrhage and hyphema, and you should be wary of it. This generally happens in older children. So these are the mask rats of retinoblastoma, white eye hypopion, unexplained thysis bulbi, cataract with neovascular glaucoma, orbital cellulitis, hyphema, and vitreous hemorrhage. We should be aware of these manifestations. Now, clinically, retinoblastoma is of four types. When you look at it on indirect in ophthalmoscopy or do an ultrasound, it could be an endophytic mass. Endophytic retinoblastoma is more, most common where the tumor grows into the vitreous cavity and also it has vitreous seeds. Whereas exophytic retinoblastoma produces typically subretinal fluid and also subretinal seeds. So vitreous seeds are classic of endophytic retinoblastoma, whereas SRF and subretinal seeds are classic of exophytic retinoblastoma. We already talked about diffuse infiltrative retinoblastoma and what is left is the mixed configuration where a child has a bit of that and bit of this. There could be an endophytic tumor predominantly with a small exophytic component. It could be both of that with a small area of diffuse infiltration. So all that is possible and that's mixed, mixed configuration. So what's important in the diagnosis of retinoblastoma? Retinoblastoma is simply a clinical diagnosis. There is nothing more to it. It's diagnosed by a good indirect ophthalmoscopy done under anesthesia with 365, 360 degree evaluation of the aura serrata with good indentation. That's how you diagnose and completely map out the tumor. Of course, ultrasonography helps. Ultrasonography B scan with intraocular calcification helps in the diagnosis of retinoblastoma and CT scan and MRI are specifically done to rule out if there is any extraocular extension or optic nerve invasion, intracranial extension, or pineoblastomas. So MRI is preferred in hereditary retinoblastoma. We talked about simulating conditions, but we also have to talk about other conditions which retinoblastoma can simulate. These are the five top simulating conditions which retinoblastoma mimics. Coats disease, PH, PHPV, toxocariasis, astrocytic hematoma, and medulloepithelioma. These are the top five conditions. Some of these children get enucleated with the diagnosis of retinoblastoma, we should be aware of it because this is something that we should understand. Now, in Coates disease, there is something called xanthocoria. Xanthocoria is this golden yellow reflex, whereas leukocoria is the white reflex. When somebody has this golden yellow reflex, then most likely it is Coates disease and not retinoblastoma. So if you have a child with whitish reflex, most likely it's retinoblastoma but a yellowish reflex, then most likely it is Coates disease, xanthocoria. Coates disease also has this irregular dilated blood vessels. So segmental dilatation of the blood vessels that end peripherally with a light bulb kind of a dilatation, that's peripheral retinal telangiectasia is classic of Coates disease. This is exactly how a Coates disease child would look like, dilated blood vessels, segmented dilatation, and peripheral retinal telangiectasia with intra and subretinal exudation. Sometimes exudation can be remote. This child has peripheral retinal telangiectasia, but the exudation is in the posterior pole. And this is yellowish feathery kind of exudation. That's very typical of Coates disease. Whereas in retinoblastoma, you see a posteriorly located tumor. Now, the second uh, simulating condition is PHPV. PHPV looks like retinoblastoma, but you find that these children have relative microphthalmus. It may not be very gross microphthalmus, but even a corneal diameter of 10 millimeter on the involved side, as opposed to 11 millimeter in the non-involved side, is indicative that it is relative microphthalmus. In addition, there is prominent ciliary process and also a posterior polar cataract with a vascular or a fibrovascular front running from the posterior aspect of the lens to the optic disc manifesting like this on ultrasound B scan. So this is the optic nerve from there, a fibrovascular fibrous front is arising and that's going to the back of the lens. That's exactly how PHPV will look like. Whereas in retinoblastoma, you don't find any of that. Now in toxocariasis, what happens? There is traction. So this kind of a fold, falciform fold forming from the tumor and going to the center. This is the peripherally located toxocara granuloma. Toxocara can simulate retinoblastoma, not just morphologically, the way it appears, 
but also because it has intralesional calcification. But the giveaway is that there is this fibrovascular front that arises from toxocariasis, a tractional element, whereas in retinoblastoma, there is no traction at all. In a centrally located toxocara granuloma, there is what is called a drag disc appearance with fibrovascular proliferation. It is also a calcified tumor, whereas a posteriorly located retinoblastoma does not have this tractional element. So tractional elements are typical for toxocariasis, whereas retinoblastoma does not have desmoplastic activity. The next one in line is retinal astrocytic hamartoma, which could be two types, non-calcified, looks like a button sitting on the retina obscuring the blood vessels, whereas the calcified variant has this kind of sparse calcification or fish egg calcification as it is called. So this is typical calcification that is seen in astrocytic hematoma, whereas in retinoblastoma you find very dense calcification. The last in the list is medulloepithelioma of the ciliary body. Now medulloepithelioma of the ciliary body is a tumor, embryonic tumor of the ciliary body, not of retina per se, although rarely retina can manifest with medulloepithelioma, that's extremely rare, but it's a tumor of the ciliary body. And it generally happens when the child in the intrauterine life. So zonules don't get developed in that area. Consequently, that is what is called zonular coloboma or lens coloboma. You can see the equator of the lens clearly, and that is a tumor. Whereas in retinoblastoma, that doesn't happen. Even if it's a peripheral retinoblastoma, subluxation of the lens is very rare unless there is gross ciliary body extension. So that's how you differentiate medulloepithelioma from retinoblastoma. Now going on to classification. Classification is extremely important in retinoblastoma. Tumor classifications are of two types. In any cancer for that matter, there are two ways of classifying. One is staging. In staging, survival of the patient or life is the outcome, whereas in grouping, organ salvage or eye salvage is the outcome. So we have staging for retinoblastoma, we have grouping for retinoblastoma. And most important about classification is that it should follow the logical sequence of evolution of the disease. It should be very simple and easy to recall. Remember how difficult Reese Ellsworth classification used to be. Nobody can remember it. It's difficult to remember. You have to refer to something, something that is on the wall or a chart to recall it. It's not something easy that you want to remember. Most important is that it should be applicable to current therapeutic modalities. So these are the criteria for classifying retinoblastoma. So the staging system is this. This is called International Retinoblastoma Staging System, where stage zero means no enucleation has been performed. Stage one, is where enucleation has been performed and the tumor is completely resected. And who has to tell you that? Pathologist. So pathology is extremely important in the management of retinoblastoma because pathologist has to tell you whether there is any microscopic residual tumor, which immediately makes it stage two. Stage three is regional extension to the orbit and regional lymph node extension. Until stage three, there is excellent prognosis for retinoblastoma, more than 90% survival. This is the watershed zone. Between stage three and stage four is the watershed zone. Stage four has less than 5% survival. So from 90, 95% survival to less than 5% survival in metastatic species. Mainly stage four comprises of hematogenous or CNS metastasis. Hematogenous is further subclassified as single and multiple. And CNS extension is further subclassified as precasmatic, CNS mass, and leptomeningeal disease. Retinoblastoma grouping, there were two earlier, Rieselsworth and SN. Now we have moved on to international grouping of intraocular retinoblastoma, where tumor is classified as A to E, depending on its size and other accessory features. A tumor less than 3 millimeter is group A. So small tumors are group A. B is for bigger tumors. Bigger tumors, that means that tumor more than 3 millimeter in diameter, tumor in the macular area, tumor in the foveal area, tumor in the juxtapapillary area less than or equal to 1.5 millimeter in the optic disc, and tumor with subretinal fluid. All these go to group B. So group Small tumor less than 3 millimeter, non-macular, non-juxtapapillary, whereas group B is a larger tumor 
which is close to the optic disc and in the macular area affecting the fovea or has subretinal fluid group c or confined tumor is a tumor which is associated with focal subretinal or focal vitreous seeds now we already talked about the fact that exophytic tumors have subretinal seeds and endophytic tumors have vitreous seeds so group c is either a exophytic or a endophytic tumor with focal subretinal or vitreous seeds d is diffuse so any exophytic tumor with diffuse subretinal seeds or any endophytic tumor with diffuse vitreous seeds goes into group d group e are potentially enucleobilized where tumor involves more than 50% of ocular volume the child manifests with neovascular glaucoma high femur or vitreous hemorrhage and there is obvious invasion of the anterior segment structures that is group e this is international grouping of intraocular retinoblastoma there are two variants philadelphia variant and the los angeles variant but you don't have to go into those details but grossly this is how the international grouping of intraocular retinoblastoma is done what is really new is tnm classification tnm classification has two types clinical t and pathological t n and m of course are clinical and pathological so clinical tnm is more important than pathological tnm of course both are important in terms of complete uh, grouping of the disease this is something which is little difficult to remember this is always a part of any research study that you do you are supposed to classify using tnm currently most journals insist on it what is the beauty of this tnm classification of retinoblastoma and ajcc8 is the category of h this is the only malignancy so far where heritability or heritable trait has been added as a classifying factor so it is not tnm it is tnm h in retinoblastoma and that is some something important for you to remember once we have classified the tumor the next step is obviously management of the tumor the goals of management are very very straightforward there are three goals primary secondary and tertiary salvage of life is the primary goal any malignancy for that matter renal cell carcinoma breast cancer salvage of life is the primary goal if that is possible you go on to salvage the organ in our case it is the eye that is the secondary goal if organ salvage is possible then you go on to optimize function that is vision never reverse your goals life salvage comes first followed by eye salvage followed by vision salvage let's look at some of that these are of course the management modalities that are available for retinoblastoma now if you have a small tumor a very small tumor where there is no risk to life there is no risk to eye tumor is about 3 to 4 mm in size then you have to definitely think of optimizing vision so the challenge in a small tumor is not life salvage or eye salvage but the challenge is producing minimal scarring and minimal collateral damage with an aim to produce optimum vision so cryotherapy is one of the modalities for managing a small tumor cryotherapy is typically performed for tumors which are 3 to 4 mm in diameter and 3 to 4 mm in thickness located in the periphery of the retina now cryo is heavy cryo here it is called triple freeze thaw cryotherapy where the tumor is frozen thrice and thawed spontaneously thrice so what happens then is collateral damage so small tumor like this ends up with a large scar of course the tumor is gone there is 90% success but the scar is much larger than the tumor that you began with which is okay for the nasal periphery but if it's a temporal mid periphery then it may cause epiretinal membrane formation dragging of the macular fovea may not the child may not have 20 20 vision and also if there is repeated attempted cryotherapy in the same area there could be atrophic retinal break there could be tractional retinal detachment so cryo is good but it does have certain complications which should be aware of this is how we do cryotherapy we elevate the tumor and center it on a 3 mm large cryo probe tumor is elevated on indented and centered this kind of a indentation actually produces what is called temporary enemization it reduces the choroidal circulation because you are indenting the choroid and the retina so 
because of which transmission of cold is rapid faster there is no leak of temperature so tumor freezes faster and minimal collateral damage will be produced if you indent the tumor very nicely like this and freeze it completely this is a tumor completely frozen and you see a small haze around the frozen tumor that that is nothing but a small layer of vitreous that is frozen along with the tumor so the cryotherapy is so heavy that you have to stop not at the freezing of the tumor but a small bit of vitreous a cuff of vitreous around the tumor also needs to be frozen so that's a heavy cryotherapy and that results in a large scar that results in a scar like this so the next focal modality in management of retinoblastoma is or was photocoagulation the principle of photocoagulation was to enemize the tumor or cut off its blood supply by using this large diameter laser burns around it not in one row but in two rows like this so what happens you begin with a 3 mm tumor and end up with a 6 or 9 mm scar and you also cause blockage of the blood vessel that is passing through the area so vascular occlusion larger scar visual field defect so if a patient were to have a say a juxtapapillary tumor somewhere here so what will happen if you photocoagulate it there will be superior arcuate scotoma so visual field defect internal limiting membrane rupture causing vitreous seeds and also because you are blocking the blood supply there is reduced chemotherapy uptake these are the problems with photocoagulation so it is no longer preferred as the focal modality but instead it is reserved for those situations where transpupillary thermotherapy may not be available but ttd has come about as the primary focal therapeutic modality ttd is very beautiful because it does not photocoagulate the retina it only increases the intertumoral temperature by about 45 to 60 degree celsius thus causing very gentle tumor cell apoptosis that is how thermotherapy works so you do thermotherapy not around the tumor but on top of the tumor if you do around the tumor then you get a larger scar as in photocoagulation but when you do on top of the tumor your scar is not going to be larger than the tumor that you began with that's the advantage of thermotherapy that it produces a localized nice well circumscribed small scar as small as the tumor that you began with it's extremely safe to do in the paramacular area or very close to the fovea there is no desmoplastic activity because you are not photocoagulating tissue here you can see the blood vessels that are passing through the scar you can see in high magnification a classically patent so ttt has least damaging effect in terms of collateral damage to the surrounding retina the blood vessels and an fibro layer and it is definitely the preferred option in the management of smaller tumors now what is new in ttt is icg enhanced ttt that's called ttt plus where icg has a synergic synergistic effect with the wavelength that is used in transpupillary thermotherapy that is semiconductor diode laser and thus causes rapid regression of the tumor it is typically used in patients where there is a tumor on top of a scar like this patient always had this scar and this small tumor recurred on top of a avascular scar without any pigment background where the uptake of normal ttt is going to be less so there if we were to give icg and then do simultaneous ttt the uptake would be much better resulting in regression and in our series we found a small series of course 80% regression in refractory tumors with icg enhanced ttt and that you can use as a part of your armamentarium so in focal therapy what is the current um, agreement is that less is more that means that more gentle you are more uh, gently are in terms of causing collateral damage it's much better and ttt has taken over focal management modalities now what if you have a little larger tumor larger tumor means tumors which are not having any risk to life but of course they may have some risk to loss of an eye or risk to loss of vision say a tumor is about 16 mm in diameter 8 mm in thickness etc plug brachytherapy is extremely good it causes about 90% success in tumor control this is how we uh, do dosimetry for a plug we determine how much the optic nerve is getting how much the lens is getting in terms of radiation damage and then 
provide a very safe plaque brachytherapy. This is a surgical step of plaque brachytherapy. You begin with a small uh, peritomy in the quadrant where the tumor is located. Dissect the tumor, dissect the tenons, isolate the extracular muscle, and then measure exactly where you're supposed to pay, place the plaque. This is determined by your indirect ophthalmoscopy, which you already performed. Mark that area, localize it again by indirect ophthalmoscopy, either by using a transcleral uh, uh, um, helium neon laser or by visualization. That's a transcleral helium neon laser being used. That's the ruthenium plaque that goes in under the extraocular muscle and gets sutured to the sclera. So that is the end of the procedure. It produces extremely good result. You see plaque brachytherapy has regressed the tumor, but the disadvantage of plaque brachytherapy is that the subtle scar that is around the area of the tumor. See, this was the tumor that we began with. That's the regressed tumor three years later. But you can see RP loss in the area where the tumor was there earlier and small blood vessel occlusion. So plaque is good, but it is not conducive for good vision in uh, locations which are juxtapapillary and uh, macular foveal. So plaque is still used as a secondary management modality following chemo reduction failures or residual tumors, but not primarily. So plaque has specific indications. Now, what about expense for the plaque? Plaque is expensive, we thought, but the new Indian plaque is extremely good and it is highly uh, effective and is inexpensive. So this is something that you can consider. Now going to external beam radiation, it is only mentioned to be condemned. External beam radiation was a range, range in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. It was uh, believed to be the only effective modality in managing retinoblastoma with high success. But when you look at the success rate, you find that the success is only good in results worth 1, 2, and 3. But when it comes to group 4 and 5, success falls to about 40 to 50%. That is not the only problem with radiation. It comes with its set of complications, some of which are treatable, some of which are not treatable. Cataract is treatable, retinopathy is treatable, papillopathy is not treatable. Some children go into thysis bulbi, and of course there is orbital and hemifacial growth retardation. These are still okay, but what is not okay is second malignant neoplasm. Look at the incidence, 35%. 35% of children who have external beam radiation under the age of 12 months who have heritable retinoblastoma develop second malignant neoplasm. That means that if you were to subject a child to external beam radiation um, under the age of 12 months in a heritable situation, almost one third of them are going to succumb to second malignant neoplasm when they are teenagers. One third of them, that's a big number, as opposed to only 6% if you are not to give radiation. So you have a straightaway survival benefit of 29% if you were not to do radiation. So that is something that's very important. Radiation is never considered the primary management modality in retinoblastoma. It's only used for salvage, for orbital extension, etc. It's no longer favored. What changed the management of retinoblastoma was this November 1996 issue of Arcus of Ophthalmology, now called JAMA Ophthalmology where there were a set of four articles, each describing the same treatment modality, chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, they called it chemo reduction and chemotherapy plus local treatment. So basically, chemotherapy with local treatment has arrived. It was in November 1996 that it was reported. And from there on, it simply took over. It changed the management of retinoblastoma. It was actually a paradigm change from the hazards of radiation and enucleation where uh, children still develop metastasis. This was a pleasant change where you could save life, you could save the eye, and you could also save vision. Chemotherapy initially started as intravenous standard dose. Now there are several forms of chemotherapy. Intravenous high dose, new adjuvant chemo reduction, adjuvant chemotherapy, intra-arterial chemotherapy, periocular in the form of injection, and even epibulbar drug delivery system, which is called a chemoplak, intraocular chemotherapy, intravitreal, and intracameral. 
Now, intravenous chemotherapy or chemo reduction, as it was called IVC, is a method of reducing the tumor volume to allow for more focused, less damaging therapeutic measures. It was hailed as it, it was like going back in time. Example given is like if you have a tumor which is about 20 millimeter in diameter, you can actually make it shrink to about five or six millimeter in diameter before you hit it with laser. So you're actually going back in time as if it is diagnosing a child about six months ahead of time. Even if the child has come to you with an advanced tumor, you can make it shrink and make it smaller before you deliver focal therapeutic modality. Drugs are very simple and straightforward. Carboplatin, etoposide, and vincristine, very common, inexpensive drugs. But before each cycle of chemotherapy, you do uh, external examination under anesthesia and then do what is called a chemo cryotherapy. Chemo cryotherapy is a small spot of cryotherapy in the extreme periphery to break the blood retinal barrier so that there is increased intravitreal uptake of chemotherapy. And you can also start focal therapy from cycle four onwards. Now, how does chemotherapy help? Chemotherapy makes the tumor smaller. So chemotherapy helps produce a smaller scar. So this is the tumor. This is one more tumor here. Reduced to a small scar, reduced to a small flat scar. The advantage is that macula is clear. Why does that happen? That happens because of this principle of chemotherapy or the tumor reduction where the tumor always regresses to its source of blood supply. This is a very nice example. Here, the tumor is deriving its blood supply from the suprotemporal arcade. You can see that, right? Large dilated blood. Now, when you start giving chemotherapy, tumor regresses towards its source of blood supply, that is the suprotemporal arcade, thus freeing the fovea and macula very early on. So this is, you can see this tumor is impinging on the foveola. After one cycle of chemotherapy, it's left the foveola and it is moving peripherally. After three sessions of chemotherapy, fovea is extremely clear. This child has a good prognosis for vision and the tumor has regressed towards its source of blood supply. It always holds on to its source of blood supply, thus freeing the fovea macula very early in the course of treatment. So that maximizes vision. The second advantage of chemotherapy is that the subretinal fluid goes away very rapidly. This is a patient where there is subretinal fluid and it goes away very rapidly. As you see here, SRF is gone completely, thus again maximizing vision. So reduction of the tumor away from fovea macula and reduction of SRF very early on in the treatment has vision salvage as an advantage. So this form of chemotherapy called IVC or intravenous chemotherapy was the standard of care in the early 2000s. From late 1996 to about 2010, this actually ruled with good prognosis. In the SHIELD series, you find that 100% eye salvage in results with 1, 2, and 3. But when you go to advanced tumor, it is not so great. 25% in 5B, 50% in 5, which may be okay for the West. But in India, where or in Asian countries where Advanced retinoblastoma is the way children manifest. In our series of about 1,000 eyes, we found that 75% of eyes were results worth 5 and 30% were results worth 5B. So if children were to present with advanced retinoblastoma primarily in a country, then if you were to do intravenous chemotherapy alone, then you have success rate as low as 50 or 25%, which is not good enough. So we have to think of alternatives. And those alternatives for advanced retinoblastoma are high-dose chemotherapy coupled with periocular chemotherapy. Now, high-dose also uses the same group of drugs, carboplatin, etoposide, and vincristine, but with a higher dosage. And that is more effective, as you see here. Much advanced tumors filling about 75%, 80% of vitreous cavity reduce nicely with high-dose chemotherapy. So high-dose chemotherapy works well. It's relatively more effective than standard dose chemotherapy for group D and E. That's before intra-arterial chemotherapy came in. So before about 2009-10, we had only standard dose intravenous chemotherapy and high dose intravenous chemotherapy. We did not have anything else. Then intra-arterial chemotherapy came in. Intra-arterial chemotherapy is a technique where chemotherapy is delivered straight into the ophthalmic artery by 
catheterizing it. So we actually have to use a catheter to get into the ophthalmic artery. This is a 400 micron catheter put in place by an interventional neuroradiologist. Then we inject a set of one drug, two drug or three drugs. That depends on the institutional protocol. You simply peep into the ophthalmic artery like that, not to cause spasm and inject a group of drugs. We typically use three drugs, topotecan, melphalan and carboplatin because we want maximum effect and minimum uh, cycles of intra-arterial chemotherapy. This in some way uh, reduces the expense to the patient. This is age-dependent dosage of intra-arterial chemotherapy protocol. It works beautifully well. You see here, this is a patient where there is bullous retinal detachment gone completely after a couple of cycles of intra-arterial chemotherapy. One more child with bullous retinal detachment, tumor is nicely calcified after three sessions of intra-arterial chemotherapy. Similar example. So intra-arterial chemotherapy works extremely well in advanced retinoblastoma. You see that this is about 75% of vitreous volume, reduced to a almost flat scar with the optic nerve and macula nicely visible following three sessions of intra-arterial chemotherapy. Even in secondary recurrences, so this child had a recalcified scar earlier, suddenly he comes with a local tumor recurrence and that was treated with a session of intra-arterial chemotherapy. So it can be used as primary modality of management of retinoblastoma or for recurrences. Technically, it is very feasible. 98% is the cannulation rate in our series with only two patients needing balloon. So the cost is the only barrier. So intra-arterial chemotherapy is the most effective management modality for group B and E retinoblastoma and for large recurrences. For A, B and C, anything is okay. Intravenous is totally comparable to intra-arterial for A, B and C. But only for D and E, we have a major advantage with intra-arterial chemotherapy. So the next issue is about vitreous seeds. Vitreous seeds are the major bugbear in the management of retinoblastoma. Now there are, how do vitreous seeds form? That is important for us to know. Vitreous seeds can form because of two mechanisms. One is a small break in the internal limiting membrane that makes the particles of tumor or the clumps of cells get into the vitreous cavity and those can proliferate. The second way a vitreous seeds forms is sprouting of a tumor. Suppose there is an endophytic tumor, a small sprout or a bud will form on an endo endophytic tumor and the bud will break off and this free small tumor will get into the vitreous cavity and will proliferate as a small spiro sp spheroid part of a tumor. So basically it can sprout into the vitreous cavity. So either by breaking in the internal limiting membrane or sprouting of the vitreous seeds cavity, they have a capacity for clonal expansion. Admin, can you please see the regarding the connectivity? Admin? Yes, sir. Dr. Hanawa's bandwidth has gone down again. Sir, can net down over there? Okay, he is uh, reconnecting and uh, we'll soon have him in the webinar. I've just now spoken to him and uh, he'll be soon connecting. There was some network issue there. Now it has been resolved and he's back. Am I okay? okay? Yeah. Is that okay? Right. Yeah, yeah, it's fine.
Yeah, I was talking about uh, once the uh, vitreous seeds get into the uh, maybe there is some network issue. You can uh, put your your own video off so that uh, your we can see it's your voice gravity. in the slides. There's a uh, method. Okay, fine. Is that okay now? It's okay. Absolutely fine now. All right. So one is adherence independent means that the cells need not settle on that is the retina. Cells can proliferate independently in the vitreous cavity, and nutrition that is derived from the vitreous is enough for the cells to proliferate. So this is called adherence independent growth. Whereas adherence dependent growth is the cells necessarily have to settle on the surface of the retina, and then they can proliferate. So then they develop what is called epiretinal seeds. So adherence independent and adherence dependent growth pattern. Now, what are the types of retinoblastoma seeds? I'm not calling them vitreous seeds at this point in time. I'm calling them retinoblastoma seeds because that's the change currently. That is the very recent change. We only knew seeds as vitreous seeds earlier. That is how we knew seeds. Now we have further classified them as prehyloid seeds subhyloid seeds, epiretinal seeds, intraretinal seeds, subretinal seeds, and intracameral, which is further classified as depository and infiltrative. I'll briefly explain all of these. These are the classic vitreous seeds. We always knew that there are vitreous seeds and this is how they look like. Now with OCT, we can further classify them as prehyloid seeds, depending on the location. This was by great work by Munia. Subhyloid seeds, again, OCT dependent classification. And in the retina, they could be epiretinal seeds, intraretinal seeds, and subretinal seeds. This is how they look like. This patient has epiretinal, subretinal, and intraretinal seeds. All types of seeds are present in the same patient. Now, in anterior chamber, you could have what is called depository seeds. That means that there is no contiguity. Vitreous seeds pass through the zonules, get into the anterior chamber and settle in the anterior chamber. That is depository. Whereas infiltrative would mean that there is infiltration of the trabecular meshwork and the ciliary body and the iris and the tumor cells come into the anterior chamber. So depository seeds are not dangerous. They're just an extension of vitreous seeds coming into the anterior chamber. Whereas infiltrative seeds are more dangerous because they would have infiltrated the ciliary body, trabecular meshwork and the iris before they come into the anterior chamber. Now, these are very typical infiltrative anterior chamber seeds. And you can see that there is a tumor tissue in the anterior chamber angle. And the first sign, even before you see something in the angle, is what is called a T-shaped pupil. There is straightening of the edge of the pupil in the area wherever there is angle or iris infiltration, which can even be subclinical. So if the child has a nice circular pupil, that is fine. Suppose for no reason, if a child were to develop a squarish edge to the pupil like that, a D-shaped pupil is an indicative indicator of anterior chamber infiltration. Now, what are the morphological classification of seeds, which is seeds? Morphological classification is again described by Munir, where he classifies them as dust, which are small particles of the seed in the vitreous cavity. Cloud, as the name indicates, a very dense collection of vitreous seeds where each seed is not seen discreetly. That's a cloud and spear are large globules of vitreous seeds floating in the vitreous cavity. So we have a dust, we have cloud and we have sphere and then we have mixed. Mixed has all forms in the same eye. The next question is how do we treat vitreous seeds? There are two clinical situations. One is when there is a viable retinal tumor along with vitreous seeds. So there is a viable retinal tumor, but vitreous seeds are also viable. Then you cannot get into the eye. You cannot give intravitreal injection. So you do intravenous chemotherapy or intra-arterial chemotherapy along with periocular chemotherapy. When there is no retinal tumor which is viable and there are only residual vitreous seeds, then we give intravitreal chemotherapy. That is how we treat. Now, periocular chemotherapy is given deep posterior subtenance. This is how you give it between two recti. 
it could be in any quadrant ex except suprotemporal, deep posterior subtenum, suprotemporal because you don't want to inject anywhere around the orbital lobe of the lacrimal gland. That's it. So it is, we inject either carboplatin or topotican. Topotican is currently favored, two milligram is the dose. Then it produces nice results, which you see it start going away. This you can start off right from the first cycle of intravenous chemotherapy. There is no restriction to the number of injections. You can go up to six to eight or even 12 injections. These are some of the results of periocular chemotherapy. What it does is it makes more of the drug topotican or carboplatin get into the vitreous cavity more than what intravenous chemotherapy can get into the vitreous cavity. And that has a tumoricidal effect on vitreous seeds. So you can see all the clumps of vitreous seeds nicely calcified after periocular chemotherapy. This is a beautiful regression with periocular chemotherapy. This is how the child presented with massive amount of vitreous seeds, optic disc even obscured, clouds of vitreous seeds, clumps of vitreous seeds, powdery material, all gone and the tumor calcified, disc is seen, macula is seen fine after six injections. We found about 75% success in eye salvage with this high dose chemotherapy technique. And with uh, topotican, we found about 70% success. So what happens when there is intravitreal uh, vitreous seed when retinal tumor is completely gone? Then we give of the injection confirmed by a careful indirect ophthalmoscopy. Hypotony is achieved by applying gentle pressure over the eye for a few seconds. Under aseptic precautions, the eye is draped. After placing the lid speculum, pass plana is marked at an appropriate distance away from the limbus. Age-based method was used to determine the safe site for injection. Under the guidance of operating microscope, a 32-gauge needle mounted on the tubercline syringe is introduced into the center of the vitreous. The needle is steadily held in place and appropriate dose is injected gently. A 3 mm cryoprobe is applied to the puncture site with the needle still steadily held in position. The needle is withdrawn through the consolidated ice ball that forms around its base, thus precluding fluid reflex through the puncture site. Triple freeze thaw cryotherapy is performed at the injection site. Eyeball is jiggled for the even distribution of the drug in the vitreous. Uh, Antibiotic cycloplegic. Uh, you know, you freeze the area where you have injected, that is to minimize the risk of extraocular extension. There's one more way you can do it, that is by death by water. You irrigate copiously the uh, surface of the eye with uh, ringer lactate or BSS, and that has a tumorocytal activity. The third way to minimize the risk of uh, extraocular extension is to give periocular injection in the site, subconjunctival or subtenin injection in the area where you have uh, made the perforation. So there are three ways to prevent it, but cryo is just good enough. You don't have to resort to death by water or periocular injection. Now, intravitreal chemotherapy, when we began, we were very, very uh, cautious. We used to select out cases. There were a couple of vitreous seeds here that went away, encouraged by the response, we could go further. But as we went along with melphalan, melphalan was the described drug of choice for intravitreal chemotherapy, by the way, we started noticing complications. You, we found that there was retinal pigment epithelial atrophy and uh, some patients developed uveitis and cataract. So melphalan has a complication in pigmented eyes. It is not seen so much in Caucasian eyes, so it has, it causes uveitis, it causes cataract. It also needs weekly injections, which is a logistic problem because children have to be anesthetized every week. Multiple injections are sometimes up to 9 to 12, causes retinal toxicity. So we have shifted over to topotican. Topotican we already were familiar with because it was used for periocular chemotherapy. The same drug was extended intravitreally. There are experimental evidences that it is not uh, going to cause retinal toxicity. It doesn't even on ERG studies. It has much better bioavailability and it is three weekly in injections. So there are fewer injections and fewer, uh, much lower need to do uh, general anesthesia procedure. So 
intravitreal topotecan is very useful. Now, intravitreal topotecan is injected as 30 microgram three weekly. This is one child. This is actually the first or the second child where you can see after three injections, the vitreous seeds are gone completely. So very, very gentle. You can see there is no retinal toxicity at all, but the seeds are gone. This is a patient, 30-month-old child with prior four doses of periocular carboplatin. Now with intravitreal topotecan, you can see that the seeds are gone. One more child with diffuse gone after two doses. So it takes about three injections at a mean for a diffuse vitreous seeds. Ranges from one to six injections and seeds go away or calcified. This is a cloud again, got nicely calcified after three injections. Now, when you have a difficult case, like this was a difficult case, where after six injections of intravitreal topotecan, there was a bunch of vitreous that were still there, but the child has extremely good prognosis because disc and macula are healthy. There we combined it with a low dose melphalan. So melphalan generally is given as 30 microgram. Here you can reduce to 10 or 20 microgram along with 30 microgram of topotecan. So when you combine both the drugs you see that the vitreous seeds are gone. So this is called tandem therapy where you can combine topotecan with melphalan and specifically in refractory situations. This is one more example where you find that after intravitreal topotecan six injections, there's a bunch of vitreous seeds remaining. And when we combined it with melphalan, the same seeds have gone completely. So something that is very useful clinically is tandem therapy. When we reported it initially, we had 100% success with the topotecan. These were highly selected cases. But when you start using them in almost every patient where there is diffuse vitreous seed, the success falls to about 85 or 90%, which is still good enough. You know, when we began, we had no success for vitreous seeds. In fact, radiation was the only treatment that was available for vitreous seeds for which are residual. Now we have this option, which is 90 to 100% successful. When we start treating vitreous seeds, we should know how uh, they regress also. That's very important. Otherwise, how do you judge clinically that seeds have regressed or not? Complete disappearance is called type 0. Conversion into calcified seeds is type 1A or crystalline refringent dust is type 1B. Amorphous non-spherical seeds is type 2 and a combination of regression of type 1 and 2 is called type 3. This is by Munia. Suppose, for example, if you have a plump, large vitreous seed like this, it becomes nicely crenated and calcified. That is one way of regression. The second way of regression is this large, plump seed becomes much smaller and gets densely calcified. The third one is it gets smaller and the periphery of it gets calcified. The fourth one is it becomes smaller. The periphery of it remains cloudy where the center has a very dense calcification. So there are many ways of regression of vitreous seeds. And as you start seeing, you'll understand how all they can regress. These are some of the pictures that are showing regression of the vitreous seeds. Now going on to depository or infiltrative seeds. Now in depository or infiltrative seeds, there is uh, differentiation is very important. If it's only depository, then you can do either intravitreal topotecan. As you see here, intravitreal topotecan was successful in this patient and the anterior chamber seeds have gone. And in this patient, intracameral chemotherapy, 5 microgram of topotecan was all that is required to get rid of the seeds. So if there are depository seeds, you can do, do either intravitreal topotecan or intracameral topotecan. And if there are uh, infiltrative seeds, then you have to do plaque brachytherapy as well. Now, the newer uh, development is that if you have a bunch of subretinal seeds, one way to get rid of subretinal seeds is to do heavy laser or thermotherapy. Now, intravitreal chemotherapy can also take care of subretinal seeds. You can see the same patient after a few injections of uh, intravitreal chemotherapy topotecan, these subretinal seeds are gone. So this is a newer development where subretinal seeds can be treated with intravitreal chemotherapy. This is one more example, bunch of subretinal seeds very, very dense subretinal seeds after six cycles of chemotherapy, gone totally with intravitreal chemotherapy. No laser required. So consequently, when you don't do laser, then the retina remains very nice and healthy and there is good prognosis for vision. This is the close-up picture where you see that, you know, there were a bunch of subretinal seeds gone with intravitreal topotecan. So it can be used for subretinal seeds as well. So retinoblastoma seeds are 
seem to be conquered finally now can we salvage is which are potentially unsalvageable these are unique situations where there is bilateral retinoblastoma and for the sake of a macular tumor in the right eye you might start on initial chemotherapy and then you plan to enucleate the worse left eye later and left eye has neovascular glaucoma large corneal diameter high pressure these are potentially enucleable but as a matter of fact what happens is that these tumors settle down nicely and the eye is salvaged so potentially unsalvageable eyes with neovascular glaucoma and duftalmus can be salvaged this i already showed anterior chamber seats were earlier indications for enucleation now they can be saved and this is a child with limited orbital extension you see that there is a limited orbital retinoblastoma and that is completely gone and the tumor is completely calcified after intravenous chemotherapy so there is a possibility of salvage of unsalvageable eyes this is just incidental we don't purposely do it if it's a bilateral retinoblastoma you treat the other eye and incidentally some of these advanced eyes get salvaged and that happens in about 60% of situations so if you have a child the corollary is that if you have a child who is one eyed that means other eye is enucleated and you have an advanced retinoblastoma in the only eye with a advanced retinoblastoma which is potentially enucleable you can try to salvage it by judicious intensive and customized treatment if there is no risk to life so if there is risk to life you up, up front enucleate but if you find that there are no clinical risk factors and there is no risk to life then you can try to salvage this eyes so with all these put together you can see much better success in eye salvage 90% in 5a and 80% in 5b this is putting everything together including intravitreal intracameral chemotherapy so now minority of patients you, you would still need enucleation in 1970s 95% of unilateral retinoblastomas were enucleated in 2005 25% of unilateral retinoblastoma were enucleated primarily currently it is about 5% or maybe 10% in some centers that are primarily enucleated so, so enucleation still has a role but it is much less before we go on to enucleation it is important to know if there are any if there is any possibility of new adjuvant chemotherapy before enucleation this is in the literature in patients who have clinical risk factors for systemic metastasis especially advanced group e eyes with neovascular glaucoma or buphthalmus anterior segment infiltration ciliary body infiltration hyphema vitreous hemorrhage and sterile inflammation would you give chemotherapy before enucleation to reduce the risk of systemic metastasis actually there is no evidence so far that new adjuvant chemotherapy before enucleation helps but in certain situations we still do it like this patient with sterile inflammation where sclera is indurated if you were to attempt primary enucleation there might be perforation of the eye or excessive bleeding this is one situation where you would give new adjuvant chemotherapy another situation is if uh, the child has buphthalmus or staphyloma where enucleation may be very difficult or some parents want to wait for enucleation that's a, they want a morning period for the eye they might want to get enucleation after 3 months or so once they get you know psychologically settled down so there are social issues as well so in these situations if you want to start new adjuvant chemotherapy that's fine but if it is initiated it should be completed as per the protocol so if you cheat on new adjuvant chemotherapy that means that if you give three cycles and then do enucleation and then don't do anything else thereafter then the child has a higher risk of developing systemic metastasis so if you start new adjuvant chemotherapy it should be completed for six cycles now enucleation has certain fundamentals one is that primary implant is a must for every child primary implant either silicon or pmma integrated implants are not preferred because vascularization of these implants may be impeded if you give admin so primary investors batches was it not audible uh, rajesh yeah now now you are audible 
okay. we just lost connection so uh, your slide was there but we were not uh, you were not audible now you are okay fine yeah it's okay yeah it's fine all right so i was talking about enucleation primary enucleation what we follow is uh, myoconjunctival technique where each of the extraocular muscle is harvested and just attached short of the phonesis i'll show a video clip still which is better than uh, showing still pictures this is a child where myoconjunctival enucleation is being performed this is a unilateral advanced retinoblastoma in a 4 year old child Uh, you begin with a small lateral canthotomy that is to increase the space that is available for enucleation then you do a 360 degree peritomy always use blunt tip scissors and then you dissect the tenons in oblique meridia between the recti pointing the scissor away from the eye then you tag the recti just short of the insertion not right at the insertion but a couple of millimeter distally and a second set of tag sutures with 60 vicryl 8 millimeter distally and then you disinsert the muscle using a bipolar radiofrequency electrode to minimize bleeding each muscle is treated similarly starting with medial inferior lateral and superior in the order that they are inserted then the superior oblique and then the inferior oblique once the muscles are disinserted you make a small relaxing incision on the temporal conjunctiva prolapse the eyeball through the blades of the speculum and then go in between the lateral rectus and the eyeball and strum the optic nerve using a 15 degree curved tenotomy scissor and once you reach the orbital apex lift by 2 mm then you engage the optic nerve and cut you don't cut at the apex of the orbit because you don't want to cut through structures that pass through superior orbital fissure mark the area where there could be a, you can see the length of the optic nerve is 19 mm implant is placed posterior to posterior tenons posterior tenons is held up then the posterior tenons is nicely sutured using 60 vicryl sutures interrupted sutures and then myoconjunctival technique imp implies that you suture the muscle just short of the respective fornix each muscle goes towards its respective fornix which produces comparable motility of the implant as compared to even porous polyethylene there is a randomized study which has shown that already then you suture the anterior tenons with secure uh, interrupted 60 vicryl sutures then you suture the conjunctiva by what is called a continuous key pattern suture where the edges of the conjunctiva remain everted and well opposed you should not bury the edge of the conjunctiva to minimize the risk of formation of cysts then you put in a conformer and then put in a suture tarsorophy as well make sure making sure that the conformer doesn't come out or the child doesn't finger out the conformer so that's the end of enucleation now enucleation is not the end of the story because 20 to 30% of children die despite primary enucleation that's either because we haven't done the surgery well books write that 10 mm optic nerve has to be taken but i oppose that i say that longer the better even up to 19 20 mm because longer optic nerve stump you have better is the chance of getting a negative cut end like this patient who has an obvious optic nerve extension if you were to stick to the book you would cut the optic nerve there and the child will have residual optic nerve involvement whereas if you cut say at 19 20 mm you have a much less chance of having optic nerve positivity following enucleation so refined technique is important and following enucleation we have to identify the histopathological risk factors which are seen in about 50% of children in india and what are these histopathological risk factors anterior segment in, in, involvement including trabecular meshwork and the iris involvement of the ciliary body this is also a high risk factor choroidal invasion more than 3 mm in thickness or more than 3 mm in diameter that's called major major choroidal invasion and optic nerve invasion beyond the lamina cribrosa so anywhere beyond the lamina cribrosa is a high risk factor if a child has a minor choroidal invasion and optic nerve invasion of any extent again is a combination high risk factor in all these patients you give adjuvant chemotherapy for six cycles in patients who have optic nerve transaction involved
is extraocular extension, then you give external beam radiation as well. Does this really help? There was controversy in the literature, but what settled was this study where we found that if you are not to give adjuvant chemotherapy, then 76% children survive, but remarkably 24% children develop metastasis. So one quarter of children died because of metastasis if you left them at the stage of enucleation without doing anything further. And if you were to go a step further, discover that they have high risk factors and were to give adjuvant chemotherapy, then the risk of metastasis fell to 4%. So this immediately gives you a survival benefit of 20%. So look at the number of children that you add to the list of survivors just by identifying high risk factors and giving in which could be clinically evident with a proptosis or radiologically evident with a orbital mass or for you can see am i audible rajesh no. yeah you're audible or on MRI, you find that optic nerve is thickened. That is also orbital retinoblastoma. Secondary orbital retinoblastoma is when there is recurrence in the orbit following enucleation. Accidental when somebody makes an intraocular tumor, extraocular by doing an unwarranted surgery. Overt is when you find on the table during enucleation, you find that there is an extraocular extension. Microscopic is when the pathologist tells you that sclera is involved full thickness or optic nerve transaction is involved. In orbital retinoblastoma, there was a high mortality of 70%. Now, what we do in orbital retinoblastoma is multimodal treatment. So we begin with high-dose chemotherapy. Like this child who has orbital retinoblastoma, we have started off high-dose chemotherapy and the eye has gone into thysis. This is one more example. This is the orbital component of retinoblastoma. After new adjuvant chemotherapy, you can see that the eye has gone into a nice comfortable thysis and the eye is much smaller and consolidated, then you would do a enucleation with a long optic nerve stump, deliver stereotactic radiation to the orbit and give additional six cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy. So this is a year long treatment where you begin with new adjuvant chemotherapy until the radiological resolution of orbital tumor. Then you do a safe limited surgery. Then you give stereotactic radiation. Then you give adjuvant treatment that is called multimodal treatment, a sequential combination of surgery, radiation and chemotherapy. This works beautifully well for optic nerve invasion. You see thickened optic nerve here become normal after six cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Intracranial extension to cavernous sinus, untreatable earlier. Now resolved following neoadjuvant chemotherapy. What is left is in the superior orbital fissure, eminently treatable with stereotactic radiation. And for massive tumors like this, we don't have to do orbital excentration but you can salvage cosmosis by a custom ocular prosthesis following enucleation only. So this is possible, salvage of cosmosis and also life is possible with multimodal treatment. So orbital RB also now has a cure. So with all this that I described, what is the prognosis finally? You know, 1000 plus patients who have completed five years of follow-up when we last analyzed, we found that 95% of children were surviving. So survival is very high, 95%. And mortality because of metastasis is about 5%. Now, in 36% of children, primary enucleation was required because this is a decade-old uh, kind of collection of cases. So earlier, we would do more primary enucleation. Now, we do less than 5%. So this number will very soon change. Chemo reduction in any form, intra-arterial, intravenous, resulted in overall 90% eye salvage. And those who had eye salvage, 95% had vision salvage and 50% had vision more than 20 by 40. Now, these are some of the video clips of children who have bilateral retinoblastoma and so active. Johnny, 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 yes, Papa, eating sugar, no, Papa, telling lies, no, Papa, open your mouth. This is, a, this is a child with bilateral Very RP. One good. Eye is what is your... You can't Johnny, believe that. But in the other eye, he has, you know, recent recurrence, recent recurrence, which was... Sorry. Yeah. 
you see there is a recent recurrence here which has been treated and very close to the macula, macula very close to the disc but he's able to do all his normal activities he's able to draw paint everything so vision salvage is not a theoretical thing it is actually real and both these children have bilateral retinoblastoma and she is actually playing like a teacher Start. hi i am ishka teacher today i am going to tell you a lesson about to a apple and h hat i'm starting that's about her and this child with one eye inucleated other eye uh, has a paramacular tumor and she maintains Hi, good amount of vision even to play music is very good at study vision salvage is a reality that the plasma is not at all theoretical of course there are socio economical ba economic barriers to care there are challenges and there are solutions as well but if you have a nice uh, program where there is a social uh, worker and you channelize funding from ngo such as can kids and uh, you know there are many ngos which can uh, help you with more than 90% compliance success can be achieved in uh, uh, rec in in follow up and complete management future prospects will be in genetics early diagnosis improved focal therapy focal drug delivery systems and advocacy this of course a old um, slide that dr gary gally had lent to me just to show how genetics can work you know this is a father who has bilateral retinoblastoma his first born child had bilateral retinoblastoma and they knew the mutation already in the father and the first born when the second child was under conception the child underwent prenatal diagnosis the first child was born with bilateral macular retinoblastoma so at the time of birth the child had bilateral macular retinoblastoma the concept was to induce delivery early so that when the child is born there is no tumor so they induced early delivery the child was born with normal fundus but as the child aged a small tumor developed there that was this is a small tumor that has developed dr galli at that time did photocoagulation so the child maintains 2020 and is a advocacy tool you can tell from a child's eyes if he's happy when he's sad frightened or when he's asleep You can tell many things from a child's eyes, including if he's got cancer. So this was a small, uh, you know, television commercial that was played in South American countries where the pickup rate of rate of retinoblastoma actually increased many folds just because of the white reflex uh, that was made popular. Now there are actually mobile phone apps that can also detect white reflex. and those are becoming popular in fact they can differentiate between a red reflex that is normally seen and a white reflex and if there's a white reflex you can send the picture to a reading center and they will advise on for the consultation so in conclusion i would say that retinoblastoma management seems very very complex but it is actually fairly simple there are protocols for everything and you simply have to individualize the management you have so many management modalities so many different types of patients but it is good to customize the management within the realm of protocols the current trend is definitely towards chemo reduction and focal therapy chemo reduction with intra arterial chemotherapy is the current trend and focal therapy with transpupillary thermotherapy is also the current trend with improving life eye and vision salvage and most of the management modalities that are um, showed are cost effective and are very simple to practice there is uh, no high science there it is very simple and most of these are accessible to many of us as ocular oncologists along with of course help from uh, oncology department so finally i would uh, conclude with this slide retinoblastoma they live and they are able to see all with protocol based management thank you so much if you have any questions we would be happy to answer thank you thank you dr santosh that was fantastic actually in 90 minutes time you have completed retinoblastoma covered everything and and it was such a meticulous explanation of everything that was really mind blowing i must say that most of uh, the you know uh, viewers have everything clear in their mind however we do have some questions and i would request you to answer uh, these questions um, 
uh, we can start with the first question that came and that was how to differentiate peripheral retinoblastoma variant from coloboma. What is the question? Uh, how to differentiate peripheral RB variant from coloboma? Well, coloboma is excavated, whereas retinoblastoma is uh, elevated. So that is how you differentiate. And if there is a fundus coloboma, then you might find a iris coloboma as well, or uh, what is called squaring of the edge of the cornea. Cornea is normally spherical, and if the edge is slightly straightened, or if there is a iris coloboma, then obviously you uh, lean in favor of a coloboma. And coloboma is typically excavated, whereas retinoblastoma is elevated. That's how we differentiate. Absolutely. Uh, there's another question uh, that Abhishek wants to know. What's the meaning of plicoid thickness invariant? Well, you know, for in tumor terminology, plicoid is something where the height of the tumor is less than or equal to 20% of the diameter. Suppose the tumor is 10 millimeter in diameter. If it is 3 or 4 millimeter, it is not called placoid. But if it is 2 millimeter or less, then it is called placoid. That is the definition. So placoid variant of retinoblastoma is a variant that occurs in older children and has a creeping kind of a quality. It occurs, starts in the periphery and creeps posteriorly. It is a totally opposite of normal retinoblastoma growth pattern. Normal retinoblastoma occurs bang in the macular fovea and then goes peripherally. Here it occurs in the periphery and then goes towards the macular fovea. The third aspect with a placoid tumor is it's acalcific. So you all know that calcification is most sensitive, specific sign for retinoblastoma. But when it is acalcific, what do you make out of it? So that you have a contradiction there, isn't it? So that is the reason why these are not diagnosed. Uh, then there is one question regarding the genetics and histopathology of RB, the Nutsen's hypothesis. Can you explain that? That is not question. What is the question? Genetics. Uh, the question is, please explain yeah. the genetics and histopathology of RB, the Nudson's hypothesis. And Genet then, can you hear me? Genetics. Had Genetics and histopathology yeah. of RB. Yeah. What is that? Yeah, it's genetics and histopathology of RB. Well, I, that is a lecture by itself. Uh, it's, it's actually a lecture by yeah. itself. I don't and think I can explain it. We much. have one question that is, how do you define microscopic residual disease in IRSS stage 2? Microscopic residual disease is when the pathologist tells you. So when you enucleate, you know, enucleation obviously has to be performed to know whether there is microscopic stage two or not. So when you perform enucleation, you send the eyeball to a pathologist. Now they have a protocol based sectioning of the eye. Earlier, what they used to do was pupillar optic calot, a single, single calot used to be taken. Now, along with pupillar optic calot, now they're supposed to take lateral sections also and bread low, and then find out if there is any area where there is cleral invasion. If there is cleral invasion, then obviously there is some microscopic spillover of the tumor into the orbital cavity. That becomes microscopic residual. The second example of microscopic residual is when the optic nerve transaction is involved. That means that the residual part of the optic nerve still has some tumor. That is again microscopic residual. Uh, there is one question that in a child with regressed retinoblastoma who was on regular follow-up, cataract has developed. So what is the best time to remove the cataract after how many months of regression and what precautions to be taken? Right. So cataract surgery can be done safely after six months. But six, six months is difficult to wait because you're not sure whether the retinoblastoma has regressed or whether it has recurred. You have only ultrasound to monitor if the cataract is dense. So we do it at about three months for sure. But the cataract surgeon who does it has to be told that it has to be by a clear corneal approach. They should not violate the limbus. They should not do peritomy, number one. Second is that they should never do primary posterior capsulotomy. They should nicely polish the posterior capsule and put a large optic eye will. All the, all the you know, measures that you take to minimize the risk of posterior capsular opacification, yet retain the barrier of posterior capsule so that if there were to be an unknown recurrence behind when you uh, were not able to visualize the fundus, that should not come into the anterior chamber. So you have to take those precautions. Then you can do safe cataract surgery. 
Absolutely. We do it all the time. Yeah. yeah. Now, there's one question regarding settings that you use for TTT and photo coagulation. Mm -hmm. What settings do you use for TTT and photo coagulation? Well, I don't do photo coagulation, but TTT, there is a graded approach. 300 milliwatts, 1300 micron is a spot size of the large diameter a large spot TTT machine, which is indirect ophthalmoscope delivery system. You can reach right up to the aura, where you start with a 300 micron, I mean 300 milliwatt uh, PA, and you concentrate on the center of the tumor and use three spots and wait for subtle change in color. You should not photocoagulate. You simply have to make the tumor a little paler. Once you see the subtle change of color, in the rest of the area, go you go and color match. With 300, if there is no color change, then you increase it to 500 or 600 and finally you go to 800. Beyond 800, it is not advisable because it causes rupture of the internal limiting membrane, thus causing vitreous seeds. So 800 is the highest limit I would go to and 300 is the lowest. Below, behind, below 300, you can go up 100, 150. That if you are doing a very localized TTT for a paramacular or a juxtapapillary tumor where you want to preserve the anatomical integrity of those structures, you can go to a lower part, but generally 300 to 800. Then we have a question from Dr. Aditi Mehta. She wants mm -hmm. to know, uh, should LIO photocoagulation be done only around tumor or also on the top of tumor like TTT? LIO, I don't advise, but LIO, if you do it, it has to be done around the tumor because LIO has a smaller spot size. Even if you reduce the power or energy to a much lower level, there's a very high risk of ILM rupture. Now, ILM rupture can cause vitreous seeds. So that's how Hungerford, um, uh, you know, when he described a series where he had a higher chance of vitreous seeds following photocoagulation, he uh, actually described that the photocoagulation was done on top of the tumor. But when you do it around the tumor, that risk of vitreous seeds is gone. So you do around the tumor, not on top of the tumor with photocoagulation. In TTT, you do on top of the tumor. There's a question regarding inter intra-arterial chemotherapy. A bit, uh, you know, uh, from where exactly which artery the catheter is inserted and how exactly it is done. It's from the uh, femoral. You explained it very well when you were presenting, but maybe a little bit. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, all, it's done by the femoral approach. And then you get into the internal carotid artery and then into the ophthalmic artery. So it's, uh, it's just like doing any uh, catheterization, femoral approach, internal carotid and ophthalmic artery. Of course, uh, the uh, interventional neuroradiologist has to know the anatomy and also the variation. Sometimes the ophthalmic artery can exit from internal carotid artery in a very oblique angle, in an acute angle or an obtuse angle where they, it's very difficult for them to negotiate. Sometimes the ostium may be very small. In those situations, what they do is they balloon. They go beyond the ophthalmic artery and then use a balloon to occlude the internal carotid for a few minutes. And then you inject so that the drug prefer preferentially gets into the ophthalmic artery. And you have to blanch the nasal mucosa because of the escape. Otherwise, the drug has because of nas nasal ciliary secretion, etc. I mean, uh, circulation. So uh, this is how we do it. So get into the ophthalmic artery from the femoral approach. Then regarding intravitreal injections, if you have to repeat the injection, Dr. Aditi wants to know that do you use the same uh, quadrant, the same side, or you vary the quadrant? Any, anything specific on that? Yeah, first is to choose the quadrant. You always choose the quadrant where there is no tumor. There was no tumor or no scar. And then you stick to the same quadrant, always. Unless something new happens. Suppose a tumor develops in that area or a small conjunctival cyst develops because of repeated injections and cryotherapy. Then you change the quadrant. Otherwise, you always stick to the same quadrant. Again, to know which quadrant you are given always makes it safe because if there is a small extraocular extension, etc., you can readily recognize it. If you change, keep changing your injections and cotton, then it's very difficult sometimes to pick up subtle extraocular extension, which is a theoretical risk. So you stick to the same cotton. There are a couple of questions regarding, again, very uh, for which you'll have to take another lecture, actually, maybe very long questions. But a few things regarding uh, how to apply intracameral topetican. Well, intracameral topotecan is, uh, you know, you have to actually drain out a bit of aqueous. So when you do all these injections, you make the eye slightly hypotonous. Your process of doing indirect ophthalmoscopy, 360 degree indentation of the sclera would have itself made the eye hypotonous. You can do a good digital massage. 
and then with the same needle that you inject, drain out a little aqueous, then attach the syringe, then you inject five micrograms of topotica. The dilution and all I can pass on because dilution is something very complicated. I can't explain uh, orally or in a slide. It's a protocol. It's actually a written sheet of paper which is stuck on the OR wall. You don't have to remember. You simply have to follow the rules. Uh, then there is one question regarding uh, when you start combination of uh, IV chemotherapy with focal treatment. Well, until three cycles, you don't do any focal treatment. Focal in the sense, no laser, no uh, nothing else until three cycles. From the fourth cycle onwards, you start TTT. That's because when you start doing focal therapy, there is some amount of inadvertent vascular occlusion. So the goal of chemotherapy is for the tumor to take that drug. But if you have occluded the blood vessels that are supplying <coughs> the tumor, how would a tumor get the maximum or optimal amount of drug into it? So your TTT is always started after the third cycle along with the fourth cycle. But cryotherapy, you can start early. That's called chemocryotherapy that breaks, breaks the blood retinal barrier. Then there are many messages regarding, you know, congratulating you for an excellent presentation. And there are many more who, who have really liked your presentation just as I did. Then there's one more question regarding uh, management of cystic type of tumor in retinoblastoma. And right. There is no yeah. regression pattern in that, so difficult to ascertain when to stop TTT and chemotherapy, etc. Yeah, cystic retinoblastoma is a variant. It's a well-differentiated tumor, generally uh, associated with uh, retinocytoma component located in the posterior pole and seen uh, in any age group for that matter. It has a poor response to chemotherapy because it is well-differentiated. Now, clinically, you have no way to say whether it is completely retinocytoma variant or there is a low activity in the tumor. You give chemotherapy for six cycles, but it doesn't respond completely. The size of the cyst may slightly increase and the size of the solid component may slightly decrease. That is how it remains. Now, what do you do thereafter? I would take good pictures on red cam and follow up the patient serially. As long as there is no increased vascularity, no increased subretinal fluid or new onset subretinal fluid, no change in color, no change in thickness, no change in diameter, then you do nothing about it because you now you have a stable regression. Stability itself is a regression pattern, right? So in cystic retinoblastoma, stability is considered a regression pattern. If there is any change, the ones that I mentioned, then you start treating it. Treating can be either by focal therapy such as TTT or by doing plaque vacuotherapy. Well-differentiated tumors, actually even don't respond so much to radiation. So even, even when you do plaque, you have to do a higher uh, dose of plaque, about 6,000 centimeters. There's one question which is, uh, you know, regarding the current scenario when mm -hmm. we are having corona pandemic. So any uh, SOPs devised for follow-up of retinoblastoma patients in this pandemic yeah. as most are immunocompromised and most of our hospitals have changed to COVID wards, etc. So... Any, any specific thing regarding the follow-up of these patients? Right. So in every SOP, right from uh, Australia, New Zealand to Singapore to uh, American Academy to AIOS, oncology is considered emergency or emergent. So every oncology protocol that used to follow pre-COVID are followed during COVID and they'll be followed post-COVID as well. But of course, general anesthesia is critical. So you have to make sure that uh, PPE is used and these children are screened before they come into the OT. Parents are screened before they bring the child into the OR area, all that. So initial screening we do. And then we do exactly the same. Of course, there would be immunocompromised status that you cannot because retinoblastoma itself is a life-threatening condition. So you have to take that bit of risk. It's all explained to the parents, explained consent is taken. But then you have to continue to do what you're doing. There is no change in the protocol as such. Absolutely. In terms of uh, treatment or follow-up. We are doing exactly what we're doing. There's one basic question regarding how to differentiate retinoma from retinoblastoma. Well, huh, retinoma and retinoblastoma. Well, retinoma or retinocytoma, sometimes it is interchangeably used. is a localized lesion with RP atrophy around it no subretinal fluid and minimal amount of calcification. It is a translucent lesion sitting quietly, generally seen in older individuals on routine screening, 
you look at the fundus of somebody who walks into the clinic and you see it or a parent of a retinoblastoma child that's how you see it it doesn't grow it doesn't change in appearance doesn't change in color does not have excessive vascularity so lack of blood supply rpa atrophy lack of subretinal fluid and stationary nature of it and presence of cyst within it identifies retinoma generally it's a posteriorly located tumor located juxta papillary or in the maxillary then dr chanchal wants to know the definitive differentiation of coats disease from retinoblastoma <laughs> you have well, already discussed maybe just uh... yeah i discussed yeah yes correct xanthocoria to start with then coats disease will have intra definite point in favor of coats disease and um admin the same problem the bandwidth from dr santosh there's some issue with the network uh, no dr santosh's bandwidth is again down yeah dr santosh you're back yeah, yeah okay Sorry. yeah So there was some issue with your. So you're ending it, is it? Right. Coats disease can mimic retinoblastoma so closely that it is almost uh, impossible to differentiate. I personally had a situation where there was a child who was a VIP child, so everybody retina consultants were there. I was there. I was called in to see the patient. Uh, senior retina faculty saw the patient. They said it is coats. Retina fellows saw. Everybody said it is coats. I saw. I said it is coats. and i took a picture i showed my fellow see how typical coats this is then nobody had seen the left eye of the child this was all about the right eye then i just to complete the examination after the entire gang of retina specialists went away i saw the left eye and in the macular area there was a retinoblastoma so what we had very enthusiastically discussed as coats this is was actually retinoblastoma in one eye which was so closely mimicking coats in the clinical picture i have that picture i'd show to anybody everybody would say it is coats but other eye having retinoblastoma confirm that the even the other eye had you know obviously advanced rb so it is it can be that difficult so if you have difficulty don't let the child away if you have difficulty don't do vitreous biopsy don't do any biopsy just follow up the child every 6 weeks to 3 months if there's any change then that means that uh, there is rb you you can enucleate those eyes actually if there is a sightless painful blind eye then you can enucleate uh, those eyes for histopathological Well, you have already explained that you know you don't have to do a posterior capsulotomy in children. Uh, Dr. Suresh Pandey wants to know that if there is a PCO later in life, and you are absolutely sure that there is no retinoblastoma now, there is no recurrence, etc. Can we do a posterior capsulotomy? Dr. Santosh, can you hear me? Yeah, then you can do whenever, yeah. whenever you are sure. when you are sure that there is no recurrence when there is no uh, re residual tumor then obviously that is perfect you can do posterior capsulotomy surgical or even for that matter a laser well there are a few more but i'll just take this last question for you what is your timing for ebr in multimodal treatment for extraocular retinoblastoma before or after adjuvant chemo well it is sequential so first you give new adjuvant chemotherapy confirm that there is no orbital residual then you do enucleation then immediately following enucleation that is after 3 weeks you start radiation complete radiation and then you go for adjuvant treatment adjuvant chemotherapy so radiation comes right after surgery you don't wait person tosh i must tell you that you have a lot of stamina in you know uh, discussing things and explaining things it was really mind blowing very well explained and Uh, many things that you know i have forgotten about retinoblastoma and it was a good revision for me as well because i don't deal with it now just the last thing i would like to listen from you is that you know not many people deal with retinoblastoma right so hmm. uh, what is your message for people that you know uh, 
when to what to do themselves i mean what should the ophthalmologists do themselves then when to refer and you know uh, what precautions to be taken i mean just the final message from you to all the ophthalmologists yeah first thing i would tell you is that if a if a parent comes to you with a child complaining of abnormal white reflex never ignore their complaint because they are very sure when they come to you otherwise nobody wants to bring a child to an ophthalmologist so many of these children are missed because either the pediatrician or the primary care ophthalmologist don't believe the complaint of the patient and just reassure them and send them away second is if a child has squint always look at the fundus many squint surgeries have been done without looking at the fundus that is a sad situation no fundus evaluation with retinoblastoma squint surgery has been done you know that should never happen so we are at the you know situation where we can actually diagnose retinoblastoma early so any child with complaint of even red reflex make sure that the child is dilated and the fundus is seen any squint child fundus is seen that is how you diagnose once you diagnose and if you don't have the ways and means of treating a child then you have to send the child to a, a institute or a hospital where uh, retinoblastoma is managed in a protocol based manner thank you dr santosh and uh, i would like to thank you for an excellent presentation and very nice explanation for all the queries i would like to thank the admin as well as the staff of uh, aios office kripal rana and uh, i would like to thank all the attendees who attended it and they were really you know uh, very enthusiastic they were very you know asking so many questions and it was a wonderful webinar thanks a lot to all of you thank you dr santosh thank you thank you rajesh thanks aios for everything thank you so much